glory to God. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. A familiar verse, but I'm instructed of the Lord to read this. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16. Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? Now, he's talking, if you look at the context of this chapter, he's not talking about the individual believer being the temple of God. He does, that is a Bible truth. And we see that over in 2 Corinthians. But here in 1 Corinthians, he's talking about the church as a, as a body. He's talking about the local church. The Amplified Bible says, Do you not discern and understand that you, the whole church at Corinth, are God's temple, his sanctuary, and that God's spirit has his permanent dwelling in you. Well, that would apply to us here. Amen. Amen. We are God's sanctuary. I'm talking about collectively as a local church. We are his temple, his sanctuary, and that God's spirit has his permanent dwelling in us to be at home in us. The Amplified Bible adds collectively as a church and also individually. And so it's true individually, but it's also very true corporately or collectively. And so, you know, I have a couple of questions. Rhetorical questions, I guess you'd say. You don't have to answer out loud, but but answer them in your heart. Why do we come together? Why do, why do we gather together on Sunday mornings, Sunday nights, Monday night, Wednesday night when we gather? Why do we? Now, partly we do it out of habit. All of us. I have the habit. I'm in the habit. It's just what I do on Sunday. I go to church. It never occurs to me to do something else. I mean, unless we're, you know, out of town for some particular reason, it uh, just never occurs to me to do something else. I'm in the habit of going to church. That's a good habit. Yeah. But too often, it, we can come primarily out of habit. And that's not a good thing. Amen. Too often, we just get up. We set our clock at the appropriate time. We go through our morning process on Sunday morning. We, we all do. And we have our regiment and we have our schedule and we're, we're aiming to be here at a certain time, 1030, or if you serve in a ministry of helps, you're here earlier and you purpose to do that. And we're busy doing that. And that's, and that's okay. That's part of life. But in doing that, again, too often we forget the big picture of why we're actually here, why we're gathering together. So I'll just ask you personally, why are you here? Why are you here today? Let me ask it this a little differently. For what specific purpose did you come to this place? You know, there ought to be a specific purpose. Every place else you go, you have a specific purpose. How many of you ladies just go to the grocery store and don't have any idea what you're going to buy? I know you have a shopping list. That's dangerous. To go to the grocery store without a shopping list. No, we go to the grocery store and we know what we're after. When I bought my truck, I didn't look for a sedan. The dealerships that I went to had sedans. But I didn't look for a sedan. I didn't look for an SUV. I had one. I didn't look for a crossover. I looked for a a pickup truck. I went to the dealership with a purpose in mind. I want to buy, I want to look at your trucks to see if there's one there I want. Everything in life we do has a purpose. Going to church ought to have a specific purpose. We shouldn't just drift in to church. Just, well, it's just what I do any more than, how many of you shop on certain days at the grocery store? My wife now goes, she goes to the grocery store every day, just about. But many of you have a certain day you go, to go shopping, isn't that right? Some of you do. Some of you are nodding your head. Well, just because it's a habit doesn't mean you don't go with, with purpose. Amen. Amen. 
Here's some important reasons that are often misplaced as the primary reason. They're all important. The ministry of the word, very important. That is a very important reason. The ministry to the needs of people is an important reason for going to church and having church, conducting a church service. Salvation of the lost, the infilling of the Holy Spirit, healing, deliverance, encouragement, edification. Those are all valid things we ought to have. Fellowship with one another. Isn't that so sweet? Amen. We come in here and we, it's like, uh, it's like we haven't seen anybody, haven't seen anyone, one another in, in months. Just all talking, just having a good time. That's fellowship. That's good. But the true primary purpose for, for assembling together, and I'll show it to you from the Word of God, is to experience His presence. That's the primary reason. And we experience His presence through the Word. And we experience His presence through ministry. And we experience His presence through fellowship with one another. Now that might be news to some of you. Because some of you think you don't need anybody. You can just come in late. Or just, you know, right at time, on time, or a few minutes late. And it's not because you just happen to be like that service. You just come in service late all the time. Because you, you don't want to fellowship with anybody. You're okay. You don't need anybody. You come in early. And, you know, if you talk to one or two people and then you leave. Well, that's not, that's not according to the scripture. So we do need one another. So fellowship is important. I'm not, I'm not minimizing the word. Not minimizing fellowship. Not minimizing uh, the uh, uh, ministry. Any of those things. But the primary person, purpose is to experience the presence of God. Both the Old and the New Testament reveal that God's purpose in calling his people together is that they might experience his presence and power. Go with me to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. We know the story of the temptation of Adam and Eve and how they ate of the fruit in the garden. But verse number 8 in chapter 3 says, And they heard the sound. The margin of my Bible says the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence. Everybody say presence. I never even seen that word in that verse until just now. <laughs> Glory. Thank you, Lord, for helping with my, my, me with my message this morning. I hadn't even realized that was there like that. And Adam and Eve, Adam and his wife, hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. Now, what I was going to point out was simply that the Lord came and they heard his voice. That means he came to communicate. He came that they might experience his presence. And that's what it says here. They hid themselves from the presence. The reason he came to the garden every day was so that they would experience his presence. Don't want to be a litter bug. Have you looking at that the rest of the service? <laughs> Praise the Lord. Go with me to Exodus 25. Exodus 25. Look at, now this is Moses, what the Lord told Moses about the children of Israel bringing offerings and so forth. Verse 1 says, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the children of Israel that they bring me an offering from everyone who gives it willingly with his heart, you shall take my offering. And this is the offering which you shall take from them, gold, silver, and bronze, blue, purple, and scarlet thread, fine linen, and goat's hair, 
Ram's skin dyed red. Badger skins and acacia wood. Oil for the light and spices for the anointing oil. I mean, we, we've talked about that lately. And for the sweet incense. Onyx stones and stones to be set in the ephod and in the breastplate. And let them make me a sanctuary. We are God's sanctuary. Remember that? He told the children of Israel, he said, let them make me, he told Moses to tell them, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. It's always been God's, God's plan to dwell among his people. He intended to dwell with Adam and Eve. He intended they experience his presence. But sin interrupted that. And they were not able to enjoy his presence. Instead, they hid from his presence. Thank God we don't have to hide from the presence of the Lord. Oh, glory to God. They hid because of consciousness of sin. And our conscience has been watched. Praise God. Amen. So God always wanted to, to, to uh, manifest his presence. He always wanted his, his, his people to experience his presence. Let's go on over to the 22nd verse of this same chapter of Exodus. And there I will meet with you, and I will speak with you from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim which are on the ark of the testimony, about everything which I will give you in commandment to the children of Israel. He told Moses, he said, you'll come into the sanctuary and I will meet with you. Glory to God. God, God, it's his plan to meet with us. Let us not lose sight of that. Instead, let us stir ourselves up in that. Because if anything, you've heard me say this, if I've said it once, I've said it probably uh, 25 to 50 times, anything that we do on a regular basis can lose its meaning. If we're not careful, we have to do something to keep that from happening. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. It's that way with relationships. It's that way in life. It's especially that way with the things of God. Amen. He said that I will dwell in verse number eight. I will meet and I will speak here in verse 22. That's the plan of God. Go over with, with me to Leviticus. And go to the ninth chapter of Leviticus. Hallelujah. Verse 5 and 6. So they brought what Moses commanded before the tabernacle of meeting. And all the congregation drew near and stood before the Lord. Then, lo, then Moses says, this, said, this is the thing which the Lord commanded to do. Commanded you to do. And the glory of the Lord will appear to you. Do you think maybe it was the will of God that his glory appeared to them? Or was it not his will? It was his will. He wanted them to see his glory. If you go over to verse 23. Moses and Aaron went into the tabernacle of meeting. And came out and blessed the people. Then the glory of the Lord appeared to all the people. And fire came down, out, came out from before the Lord and consumed the burnt offering and the fat on the altar. When all the people saw it, they shouted and fell on their faces. They fell on their faces in worship. God demonstrated his, he showed them his glory, but he also demonstrated his power. Amen. It's what we have in the book of Acts. The day of Pentecost. They were there in one place in one accord. And suddenly a sound came from heaven like a rushing mighty wind. And it filled the whole house. And there appeared to them divided tongues. The, the Greek says it was, it was one central flame and then 
tongues of fire divided off of that one central, central ball of fire. And one rested upon each one of them. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit. It's always been God's purpose to manifest His glory and His power among His people. Always has been. Amen. I could look at a lot of scriptures, but for the sake of time, it's run a little late. Go with me to Ephesians chapter 2. We've already read 1 Corinthians chapter 3. On your way to Ephesians, stop by 2 Corinthians. <laughs> Joe Morris would say, just drift on over to 2 Corinthians and look at chapter Look at chapter 6, verse 3. What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell with them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Well, that's the will of God. That's the plan of God. You can drift on over now to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 21. In whom the whole building, being fitted together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In whom you also, all of you there at Ephesus, would be the same here at High Springs at Impact. In whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. Other translations say by the Spirit or through the Spirit. You know, all of humanity longs for the presence of God. All of humanity longs. Even atheists who have turned cynical and have turned their back. The, the book of Romans says God has revealed himself even to them. In the things that are made. And they're without excuse. But because their foolish heart was darkened. They turned away from that. But there's a longing. On the inside of every man. To know the presence of God. It is the reason for all of the religions of the world. It is, re it is the reason for all of the pursuits. All, the, all of the frivolous things that people do. Trying to find some meaning in life. They're trying to feel that, feel that aching emptiness on the inside. Praise the Lord. God calls us together as a local church for a greater purpose. Now listen, for a great, all of these things are good, but, but there's a greater purpose than all of them. God calls us together for a greater purpose than simply reinforcing our individual Christian walk. As important as that is. By, by receiving instruction in, from the word and having our individual needs met. We should always expect these benefits. But there is something more fundamental God himself wants from our time together. See, if we're, if we're not careful, we think about what we want. What, what church should mean to us. What, what impact it should have on our lives. How meaningful it should be. But little do we stop and think about the fact that God wants something. He has a purpose. And, the, and, it's, and it's beyond just meeting our needs. He wants our needs to be met. He's provided that. All of the things I mentioned. Strengthening and reinforcing our Christian walk. He wants that. You know, being instructing from, instructed from the word like I'm doing this morning. He wants that. Having needs met, people prayed for, so forth. But God wants something himself from our time together. And here is what he wants. God is seeking an opportunity to make his presence known. To reveal his love. To demonstrate his power so we'll believe in it. And to show forth his glory and his grace. Not just show it to us. But all of these things. He wants us to experience his love. 
He wants us to experience his glory. He wants us to experience his grace. He wants us to experience his power. This is what he gets out of it. What God gets out of it, what God is after is our experiencing him. And it manifests in all these other things that I mentioned. And we, we looked at this last week. Let's look again at John, the fourth chapter. John 4. Oh, glory to God. Verse 23 Jesus was speaking to the woman at the well. He said, the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is a spirit. Those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Jesus said the hour is coming. He said this to the woman at the well in the early part of his ministry. The hour is coming and now is. Well, the reason he said it that way is it, it is coming and now is, is, is that he realized he was right on the precipice, right on the point of the beginning of a new dispensation. He was the final voice, the final prophet, and the final sacrifice of the old covenant. And his work he knew was going to be short. And he was going to wrap it up. And then God was going to usher in a new age. And that's why he said the time is coming and it's really now. But notice, he said true worshipers. True worshipers. Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever just contemplated those two words, true worshipers? That infers that there can be worship that's not true. God is looking for true worshipers. True worshipers, he said, will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. God is spirit, or is a spirit, and those who worship him must. That's, that's pretty clear, and it's pretty final. There's no ambiguity. There's no room for uh, uh, an alternative view. Those who worship him, he said, must worship in spirit. And in truth, must. That tells me that, and, and, and it also said that, he's, that God is looking, he's seeking. When you seek something, you don't seek something that's readily available because you could just take it. When you're seeking for something, you're having to look for it. Because it's not everywhere. I'm not seeking oxygen. It's all around me. God, this tells me that, that true worshipers aren't everywhere. They're not. And he knows that. And he knows who's a true worshiper and who isn't. And he's seeking. He's looking for. Can you get this? He's, his, he's interested in finding. He's, it's important to him that he's seeking God is seeking such to worship him. He is spirit. He is an individual spirit. Those who worship him must, M-U-S-T, must worship in spirit and in truth. Well, what does it mean to worship in spirit and in truth? What does, what does that mean? Is it just a kind of a New Testament phrase? Go with me over to uh, uh, Philippians chapter 3. Go to Philippians 3 and look at this. Verse 
Verse 3 says, for we, talking about the church, we are the circumcision. Now notice, who worship God in the spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. Remember Jesus said, the flesh profits nothing. When it comes to worship, flesh profits nothing. And we'll say that a couple of times. When it comes to worship, flesh profits nothing. There is no profit, let me say it differently. There is no profit from fleshly worship or flesh-based worship. No profit. So much of the church world, I mean the vast, overwhelming uh, 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 margin of the church world offer up flesh as worship. You don't believe it? Just watch their television broadcasts. Everything, and listen, I, I'm, I'm, I'm all for rehearsing and doing things right. Our, our worship team rehearses every, before every service and then they meet other times during the week to, to rehearse and to learn new things. You have to learn how to sing together. So they rehearse at the last minute to make sure everybody's, you know, got the words and got, you know, everything. But it's, it's one thing to rehearse so that you can get into the service and flow with God. But that's not what most of the church world does. They rehearse to put on a performance. And it's all about how beautiful it is. And I'm telling you, there's some outstanding productions. There's some outstanding productions. And the musical talent. And the, and, and the staging. And, and everything that's done. It is so excellent. But they don't rely on the Spirit at all. There's no room for the Spirit Churches that are large churches, they have multiple services. And what most people don't know, because most people don't go to more than one service, is the second service is a carbon copy of the first service. Right down to every mannerism. My wife and I were in a, in a, a meeting one time, and, and, and we were in a, in a Rhema church, and they had their worship band. And they went through this performance and I, I couldn't keep my eyes off the drummer the drummer was a female I wasn't just looking at her because she's a female I was looking at her because she had her head down she's playing the drums and she was whirling her head like this and throwing her hair around and she'd throw it this way and then she'd throw it that way and then she'd throw it this way and it was just so distracting I couldn't I mean I had to you had to notice it the problem is the second service is exactly the same thing Everybody raised their hand at exactly the same point. Everybody made the same gesture at exact. It was all choreographed. That's flesh. God is seeking true worshipers who worship in spirit. And I ask the question, what does that mean? Here... In Philippians, it said, we don't have any confidence in the flesh. We put no confidence in the flesh. We worship God in the spirit. The ASV, the Amplified Classic, that's American Standard Version, English Standard Version, Phillips Version, and the New Living Translation all say it this way. We worship by the spirit of God. We worship God. By the Spirit of God. All of those versions, that's the way they read. That's what worshiping in the Spirit is, if you didn't know. Worshiping by the Spirit of God. We worship God by His Spirit. That's worshiping in the Spirit. Uh, another translation, the, the New Century Version says, We worship God through His Spirit. Through his spirit. What does that mean? That means we worship God yielded to the Holy Spirit. We're yielded to the Spirit. We let the Holy Spirit 
lift our hearts. We let the Holy Spirit move us in worship. That's what that means. It means that the Holy Spirit is directing the service. The Holy Spirit is directing our our assembling and he's directing each one of us. That's worshiping through the Spirit. Worshiping God by the Spirit of God. Hallelujah. Now we know this from last week that it's important that it be in one accord. One accord. Being in one accord means that everybody comes in with the, with the same mind. Remember over in, in Second Chronicles? When they made one voice and one sound to be made in thanking and praising the Lord. But it's not just audio unity. It's heart unity. I'm going to say that again. It's not just audio or audible unity. It's heart unity. What, hap- what would happen if you'd, have, if you'd have a choir up here of, say, 50 people in a choir and only 20 of them are singing? The other 30 are just standing there. Might put their hand up. Might look off. What would you think? What would, you, would that be a spectacle or what? I'd have a whole bunch of little pictures to flash <laughs> at the choir. What in the world? There's no unity in that. They're the choir. They're the choir for heaven's sake. They're all supposed to be singing. Well, when we have a church service, being in one accord means that everybody is worshiping by the Spirit, through the Spirit. Energized by the Spirit. That doesn't necessarily mean hopping or doing anything, but energized in your heart. Energized, letting the Holy, the Holy Spirit is moving in your heart and you're worshiping in response to that inward one, inspiring us. I've been pastoring a long time now. And I can tell you that too often there is too many of us. And I'll say us because I've been guilty too. It's too many times when there are too many of us who really are somewhere else. I mean, our our body is here. We can see you. But our heart is somewhere else. Our, our attention is somewhere else. We're thinking about any number of things. You could just, you could just make a long list and, and it wouldn't be long enough. All kinds of things. Well, it says in Psalm 22 that the Lord inhabits the praises of his people. He is enthroned upon the praises of his people. Do you, do, you, do you think that includes people who are just got their hands in the air and they're singing the song, but they're thinking about their transmission that just broke in their truck? You think God's inhabiting that? You know he's not. What I'm, what I'm encouraging you in and stirring you up in today is when we come together, we have... God wants to manifest his presence. He, he, that's what he gets out. What does he get out of it? When he manifests it, then his presence and his, his glory, his love, his grace, his mercy, his goodness, all of that becomes more real in us. That's what he's after. What does he get? He gets what we get. He is seeking our getting something. What a selfless God we have. 
He doesn't want anything from us when we meet together except that we open our heart to him so we can get all he has. Glory to God. You can't even, you couldn't even make up a God that good. And other religions have tried to make up gods. None of them are like that. None of them are like our God. They're after all kinds of stuff. Our God doesn't need anything. He doesn't need worship. His only need is for us to give a, an opportunity for his benevolent, loving heart to be poured out. That's the only need he has. Oh, glory to God. Thank God. That's why it's so important the, the next time we come in and the next time and the next time and the next time and any time that we get in the habit, you get in the habit of putting your shoes on, you're in the habit of, you know, getting ready for church, get in the habit, start getting in the habit of preparing yourself to worship in the spirit. To worship, what does that mean? Worship by the inspiring and the inspiration of the spirit. Worship, worshiping God through his spirit. He's the director. He's the director. The choir director is not really the director. They're just giving an opportunity for us to have something to hook up with. But the real director is the Holy Spirit. He wants to be. Put it that way. He wants to be. And he will be. For anybody who will wake up. And turn their attention off their brownies. <laughs> Sister Browning brought me some brownies this morning, and I'm going to share a few of them with Angela. <laughs> I better quit talking about that. I'll get my mind on that. <laughs> we, have to, we, we have to purpose in our hearts. Am I making any sense? I, I know we know this, but the reason I'm saying it is because we just know it. But we don't always do it. We, I said we, we don't always do it. And God is seeking this. That should make a difference in your thinking. Jesus said the Father seeks. Would it be rewarding to you to know that God is seeking you? I seek people who are important to me. We're important to him. He's seeking true worshipers. He's looking. He's looking all through the church. The Father is constantly looking all through the church. And I'm sorry to say, most of the time, he's not finding true worshipers. And he keeps looking. He keeps looking. He keeps looking. Let's, let, let's make sure that God's heart is satisfied when he looks over here and sees us oh glory to God he may still be seeking somebody somewhere else but he's he, he, he's a, a mysterious God I don't know how he does it he can be looking over there but he can find us at the same time and we can gratify his heart oh praise the Lord glory to God amen 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 praise the Lord See how many things I skipped over here. I'm not going to go any further. I just. Yeah. Praise the Lord. God inhabits worship in the spirit. Not fleshly worship. Not worship from our senses. Not mental worship. Not. Thoughtless worship. In the Old Testament, saints worshiped God purely in the flesh. That's all they could do. But when you come over into the New Testament, you find that all praise and worship is to be done in the Spirit. All. all. There's really, there's, there's not any exception to that. There's not, a, there's not a one week a month exception of that. There's not. I'm sorry that some churches have already got their, you know, Christmas thing going you know and they're planning it but that does that's no excuse 
doesn't matter what we have planned. Jesus said, they who worship him must, must worship in spirit and truth. That's absolute. There's no, there's no, there's no cracks in that. There's no way around that. Those who worship the Father must worship in spirit and truth. Well, what, what does that mean to those who aren't worshiping in spirit and truth? They're not worshiping the Father. When we go through the motions and our heart isn't engaged with the Spirit of God, no worship. There's no worship there. It's just not happening. We, you might think it's happening. Your neighbor might think it's happening. Oh, he's really worshiping. He's loud today. That's got nothing to do with it. Amen. Those who worship the Father must worship in spirit and in truth. Must. Amen. That's just the only way to do it. And thank God for preparation. Thank God we have a, a wonderful uh, worship team. I, I, I thank God for, for what they do. It's necessary. But their purpose is to lead us. To lead us into worship. Amen. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Well, let's stand up. Praise God. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Glory to God. Father, thank you for our time together today. Your presence was real among us, Lord. Because enough of us entered in. Enough of us laid hold of spiritual things and worshiped from our heart. But the New Testament talks about going from glory to glory by the Spirit of God. So we're not disgruntled or condemned or have any negative feelings. We had a wonderful service today. We're thankful for that, Father. You know my heart, Lord. I just want everybody to get involved. I just want everybody to experience it. I just hate, Father, I just hate to see people just sitting in church and missing out. Missing out on opportunity to worship the Father with the Holy Spirit, by the aid of the Holy Spirit. Because they've not disciplined themselves. They've just got let church become a habit. And the songs are habitual and the routine is habitual. They're missing out. But you're missing out, Father. You're missing out on the opportunity to show yourself, to reveal yourself to each one of us. Oh, Father. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord, for what we do have. Jesus told the church there in, Reve in, in Revelation, strengthen the things that you do have. Father, we need to strengthen the things that we have. And we need to be reaching for more. Not, a, not out of condemnation or a, a guilt or anything like that. We just need to reach for more because there is more. Just because there is more is reason enough to reach for it. Just because it gladdens your heart, Father doesn't take anything away from us. It enriches us. But it enriches your heart, Father. Glory to God. Father, help us in our pursuit of your presence. Help us in our pursuit of your presence, Lord. We do pursue your presence. On the one hand, we have your presence because your Spirit's in us all the time. We know that. But we're talking about your manifested presence. We do pursue that, Father. Because that's not automatic. That's determined on a, on a daily basis. It's determined on an occasion-by-occasion occasion basis. And whether or not we're going to open our heart or not. So I pray, Father, that all of us will be moved to step up higher. Glory to God. Thank you, Father.